Hey guys, welcome to Gene Podgetics. This is, of course, your host, Gene. Some of you might know me as Ashad, and that is because that's because I have authored this book, The Misunderstood Bible, right here. And I have this not for resale link thing because uh, it's kind of the author's special. Your book won't have that uh, if, if you should order my book. Now, I want to go over some of the content of the book, what's in it, what you can expect to find. So we'll start with the fact that there's a preface. And in the preface, I kind of give an explanation for the book, uh, why I wrote this book, uh, who the book is for, you know, what, what, what is the purpose of it. And then kind of just a general synopsis of what's going to occur and my kind of theory overall of uh, what has happened to the Bible. Then we go on to chapter one. Let me get that open here. So here's the uh, table of contents in the book. See? Chapter one, encountering God in the West. Chapter two, textual criticism critique. Chapter one is kind of an autobiographical chapter of the book. And so by that, I mean that I'm going over my childhood, uh, how I grew up, my experience as a minority diaspora, and uh, what that means, what I thought of Christianity, going to a Catholic school, and then later a secular high school. And then the next one is textual criticism critiqued. And there I critique ideas like corpus hermeticum, documentary hypothesis, and just kind of a general uh, piercing of atheist thought and kind of the hypocrisy that they use when uh, attacking biblical theology and kind of the reliance or the reliability, I mean, of scripture. And so that's kind of the start of the anti-atheist stuff that begins in this book. So if you are an atheist and agnostic who would like to have faith in the Bible, but you find that there's just so many arguments against it, this would be a great chapter to start out with. And then for those who are faithful believers who maybe have some doubts, you've got uh, plenty of material to go in there that'll help you. Then we have some thoughts on the flood, chapter three. That is exactly as it's described as some of my thoughts on the global flood. It's not really that much. Here's exact proof that it happened, but just a few interesting parts of evidence. And then it kind of wraps up with, if you don't believe in the grand deluge, uh, you might be a Neoplatonist. So that's kind of the, the thesis of a lot of my chapters, you'll notice. <clears throat> uh, chapters four, five, and six, the law of Moses, love your enemies, and Marcionite error. Those all kind of go together. So the law of Moses part concerns, obviously, the law of Moses, kind of the uh, status of the law in the New Covenant and what it means to be following the law as one who believes in the New Testament, Sabbath, hygiene, etc., and the morality of Moses, of course. And then the love of your enemies is mainly about morality. Are we supposed to love our personal enemies as well as enemies of God or only our personal enemies? What does the Bible say about that? That's what the point of that chapter is. And then the Marcionite error is dealing with this idea that the Old Testament is this Jewish book and the New Testament is this kind of like Greco-Roman civic code book that's made by like humanists and it's nothing like the Old Testament. I soundly refute those ideas. Chapter 7 is just a simple laying of treasures in heaven. And that's really just about this idea, this kind of communist idea that uh, a Christian cannot have wealth. And I think that's completely wrong. A Christian can have wealth as long as the wealth uh, does not inhibit your behavior and as long as the wealth does not prohibit you from contributing to the kingdom of God. So if you're using wealth to increase the kingdom of God on earth, it's a good thing. If you're using wealth just for your own selfish purposes, then it's a bad thing. And St. Paul says that the love of money is the root of so many evils. Not money itself. Money doesn't possess an ontological evil. So that's kind of what that part of the uh, chapter is about. And then we have uh, Biblical Reality and Hellenic Ontology. That's chapter 8. And chapter 9 is Heaven and Hades. So Biblical Reality, Hellenic Ontology, that chapter is all about do you believe in Hellenic metaphysics or Biblical metaphysics? And even if you're an atheist, you do believe in one of those, whether you like it or not. So where do you get your morality from? Where do you get your understanding of the world from? That's what that part of the chapter is about. Very long chapter, I go into philosophy, history of philosophy, and the differences between Platonism Neoplatonism, Aristotelian metaphysics, and of course, how the Israelites saw the world. And Heaven and Hades is about the eschaton and how our belief in hell is not this Dante's Inferno idea of a torture chamber, which comes from the Orphic mysteries, and uh, Socrates is the one who copied that as well. But rather, we have the biblical understanding of hell, which is different. 
Uh, chapter 10 is just the apostolic churches, and that chapter goes into kind of a basic of here's the philosophy and history of Catholicism and orthodoxy compared in Oriental orthodoxy. Like, why do Catholics view original sin the way they do? Why do they view the text the way they do? And how does that compare to the highly philosophical language of the Greek East? And then um, the next chapter, professing to be wise, they became fools. That's an, applica an application of everything you will learn in the philosophy chapter, geared now at how do atheists unintentionally, or maybe intentionally, copy Hellenic metaphysics while pretending that they don't believe in fantastic ontology. They do. So that's what that chapter is all about. For example, Anaximander is the one who invents evolution, not Darwin. And yet you'll still have people say, well, the Bible copied myths from around it, uh, while atheists are, of course, copying Greek myths. Then we have um, another one, the myth of henotheism, chapter 12. This is dealing with this idea that there's multiple deities in the Old Testament. There's not anybody who says that. It's not familiar with the Greek of the Septuagint or the Hebrew, the Masoretic or other texts. And then uh, the ancient Trinity, chapter 13, is one of my all-time favorite chapters in here. Basically discovering the difference between what I call triunism, which is kind of a Latin Augustinian Trinitarianism. Uh, and that's the idea that you essentially have these three uh, persons, or these three substances, one could say, that are all eternal and infinite. And because of that, they're not divisible. So they're these indivisible, infinite, eternal things. And uh, they all share in common of being God. And so that's what makes them God. That's kind of, I butchered that right there, but that's the basic understanding. They all share this kind of infinite indivisibility, and they share that divine nature. Whereas the emphasis on the East was more, no, God is the Father. And so why is the Son God? Is it because he shares something in common with the Father? No, it's because he comes from the Father. So the Son is God because he comes from the Father, and he is the divinity of the Father. And same with the Holy Spirit. So here's the quote that I have from St. Athanasius on this issue in my chapter, uh, The Ancient Trinity. And it is, Whosoever hearing that the Father is Lord, and the Son Lord, and the Father and Son Lord, for there is Lord from Lord, says there are two gods, be he anathema. For we do not place the Son in the Father's order, but as subordinate to the Father. For he did not descend upon Sodom without the Father's will, nor did he reign from himself, but from the Lord, that is, the Father, authorizing it. So a lot of people freak out with that passage. They say, oh, St. Athanasius is talking about subordination. He's an Arian, but he's not. He's using subordinate in that context to mean that in terms of authority, the Son is subordinate. And that is the understanding of monarchia. The Father does have something over the Son, which is authority. The Father does have the hypostatic property of being able to cause persons. The Son does not. So the Son can never cause the Father. The Father only causes the Son. And that's the hierarchy, a.k.a. called the monarchia. And then uh, the last chapter is called The Apocalypse of Yohanan and the History of the World. And that is a deep dive into the book of Revelation. I give a great argument for the authenticity of the apocalypse. Uh, based a lot on Edward Bishop Eliot's work in Horae Apocalypticae. And then I go over the historicism of traditional Protestants, historicism in Greek Orthodoxy, and then partial preterism and, of course, uh, futurism. And for futurism in particular, we do with the kind of Jesuit intrigue involved in that. So that's it. This is the misunderstood Bible. I don't think anybody who is not aware of these topics will walk into this and then walk out completely the same. This book will help change the way you think. It'll give you a way to kind of x-ray into people's minds. What do they believe and how do they believe it? Where do they get those beliefs from, especially with atheists? You'll be able to read people's minds using this book. So I do hope that this is helpful for those who have already bought it and have started to read. And for those who haven't, I implore you, check this out and let me know what you think. And if you guys have any questions, uh, I'm always available for that. Till then, God bless. Chronicles of history, there is no set of writings with so grand a scope, or so formidable an influence, as that of the Bible. That same scripture, whose composition survived the rise and fall of empires, has now become distorted by the domain of secular institution, and the return of primordial heresy. In a way, the challenges facing the church today are mere shadows of the foregone past. Long defeated adversaries were born in the mind of contemporary man. This is the misunderstood Bible. Embark with us on a journey to understanding the truth of Scripture. Unveil the secrets of forlorn heresy, the rebirth of an ancient adversary that has plagued the church since its very dawn. This is the Misunderstood Bible, the most misunderstood book in the history of mankind.